want to start off by saying that this church was founded on, on a basic principle that indefinitely extended healthy human lifespans. They're not only desirable to people such as those in this church and the many who are listening to us live stream, but they're also scientifically attainable. And they're what our creator intended for mankind to accomplish. Now there's an individual who would very much like to be on this podium, very much like to be in the seats of this congregation right now. Benjamin Franklin. A lot of people know a little bit about Benjamin Franklin. I suggest after you leave tonight and go home, you type his name onto Google and read a little bit about his history. Because like most great individuals who are household words more than 200 years after their death, Benjamin Franklin had so many talents. He was a scientist. He was a politician. He was a diplomat. He's responsible for our country being a free nation under the kind of constitutional uh, freedoms that we enjoy. Uh, he experimented with coolants, chemical coolants, seeking a way to develop refrigeration so that food would not spoil as quickly as it did back in the colonial days of our country. Uh, his scientific exploits, of course, relate to him flying a kite and showing that electricity came from lightning bolts, but he did so much more than that. He was an entrepreneur. He enhanced the quality of printing in such a way that he franchised his printing technology around the United States. He became a very wealthy man over that. And, and he's one of those individuals that appears on our $100 bill. So again, when you go home tonight, just type his name on Google if you want to read more about him. But a little aspect of his personality that most people don't know about is he did not want to die. He envisioned a time in the future when people would live very long, healthy lifespans. And he commented in several letters that if he had his choice, if the technology existed, then he would like to be preserved and reanimated at a time when mankind was able to reverse his aging process, was able to restore him back to life. He wanted to see what the future held. He had done all this wonderful work to establish this country, and yet he was going to be in a position of not being able to visualize, to experience what this country would transform into. So the first person of, of notable fame who spoke about being preserved for future reanimation, Benjamin Franklin. And uh, he's an interesting individual. Again, I suggest everybody learn a little bit more about him because when I started reading about him, I couldn't stop. It was so fascinating. Now, Franklin's dilemma is there was no way to preserve biological tissues over the long term when he was alive. There's just simply no way to do it. To give you an example of how difficult it was, they didn't even, we're talking about mankind, they hadn't even discovered the North Pole in Franklin's time. A lot of us just take for granted what well, we always knew there was a North Pole, uh, but we didn't. Uh, it wasn't until 1909 that they finally mapped out exactly where the North Pole was. Had we known what it was really like up in the northern Arctic, theoretically, uh, Franklin and others could have been buried in, in permafrost. But the bottom line is, back in those days, didn't know where the North Pole was. And we didn't have any kinds of refrigeration availability to keep people cryopreserved or preserved in any way. That wasn't developed until 1902. So a lot of the technologies that we take for granted today, they didn't exist. They didn't exist even a short time ago in the history of the human race. And I, I, I look at that 1909 number and I think, wow, that was not that long ago. About 116 years ago, people really didn't know what was up there at the North Pole. If you told them Santa Claus was up there and his reindeer and they were building toys for good kids, you really couldn't refute that because no one had really discovered the North Pole at that time. And I use these analogies, by the way, these historical analogies, just to let us know and remind us how fast and how far we've come over a very brief period in recorded human history. We've made incredible progress, and yet uh, people doubt whether or not human beings will ever be reanimated after they are cryopreserved. Now, this lecture is really about cryogenics and cryonics. 
uh, cryogenics is the science of low temperature physics, and it's used right now across the board in all kinds of technologies, uh, technologies that you may not even realize. The reason we're able to launch rockets into outer space to float satellites around the globe is because of cryogenic technology. Without it, we may still be saying, man's never going to land on the moon because we can't even escape the gravitational force of our planet. Cryogenic technology enables that to happen. It's being used across the board in medicine. It's being used across the board in all kinds of areas that make possible what we take for granted today. And what people often don't realize is before 1957, it was considered impossible to launch a heavier than air craft outside of our gravitational pull. It simply was considered something that could never, ever be done. And yet, the cryogenics technology enabled it to happen. And right now, of course, we have satellites, we have GPS. Who could have envisioned that back in 1957 when the consensus of the experts was you could never launch anything into outer space? So how could you have satellites? How could you have GPS? How could you have these worldwide communications the way we, we have right now? Cryogenics, it's used in medicine. Some of you may have gone to dermatologist offices where they use uh, uh, liquid nitrogen just to burn off some topical lesions on your skin. It's a very efficient and safe way to remove uh, some non-malignant lesions. It's also used, by the way, whole body uh, having the temperature lowered in Japan uh, as a way of, of alleviating uh, certain inflammatory conditions. So it's not out of the ordinary for doctors to use cryogenics in the medical setting. And certainly right now, just low temperature technology, hypothermia, is routinely being used now in emergency settings, where they use the term a medically induced coma, where they're reducing people's temperature, keeping them alive for weeks at a time, and then rewarming them, allowing them to come back to life, even though they were in a state of suspended animation. The medical community is reliant at this stage on cryogenic technology for all kinds of reasons. Most of you in this room may have undergone a magnetic resonance imaging technology, uh, MRIs as they call them. That's reliant on cryogenics in order to get those incredible clear images that they're able to observe. And before they had these MRIs and these CAT scans, by the way, the technology was exploratory surgery. How many people would like to undergo exploratory surgery to rule out some problem, as opposed to going into a capsule, and after about a half hour, they take a picture of your insides, and they know what your problem may or may not be. This is an incredible breakthrough that's underappreciated. The imaging technology advances that have occurred, and cryogenics plays a major role in that. The fact that we're able to now store biological specimens at low temperatures is nowadays a given. Embryos, they're frozen routinely, and there's all kinds of philosophical debates as to what to do with embryos that are currently frozen, and maybe the parents no longer want to have children with those embryos. Some people feel those embryos should be used to develop stem cell lines that could be used to treat terminal diseases or degenerative diseases like Parkinson's. Um, and other people feel those embryos should be brought back to life. But what no one disagrees with is the fact that those frozen embryos, those frozen life forms, are resuscitatable. It's almost a given if you properly cryopreserve an embryo, you can bring that embryo back to life anytime you want. And yet, people doubt that it will ever be possible to bring back a properly cryopreserved human being. And of course, there are differences right now between a cryopreserved embryo and a cryopreserved human. We know that. But the fact is, life is able to be suspended. It's able to be cryopreserved and then reanimated. We know that with blood. We know that with sperm. We know that with ova. Uh, many females nowadays are having their, their eggs frozen for future use. And embryos, they're out there all over the place being frozen. And, and it's also by being used, by the way, in the agriculture uh, industry. Uh, very fertile cattle uh, routinely have their embryos frozen, uh, their semen frozen, their eggs frozen, and shipped all over the world for implantation because everyone wants to improve agricultural efficiency. Cryonics is the preservation of humans. 
with the objective of eventually restoring them to youthful health and life when technology evolves. The majority of people do not believe that it will be possible to ever reanimate a cryopreserved human being. What's overlooked often is the fact that a few animals out there in nature routinely cryopreserve themselves every year. They are able to produce glycerol internally. Glycerol is a biological antifreeze, and that glycerol enables their temperature to drop to below freezing without ice crystals freezing, without ice crystals forming, I should say. It is those ice crystals that form that damage our cells, that make it difficult to conceive of certain people being reanimated. But certain species of frogs and other animals, they naturally secrete glycerol, they are frozen in the wintertime from the standpoint that their temperature drops below freezing, but the glycerol protects against the ice crystal formation. They warm up in the summertime, and they come back to life. This is an example of a living organism that drops down to below freezing temperatures, comes back to life every year. So what are we doing on, on, on the scientific arena? What are we doing to emulate what's being done in nature already? Well, we're doing something called vitrification. We're using high pressure glycerol solutions to see if we can't perfuse organs and organisms and be able to restore them back to life. What you're looking at right now on the screen are rabbit kidneys. The one to the left of me, the one that looks like a block of ice, is a frozen kidney. That kidney has a lot of damage. It's damaged so badly that with today's technology, there's nothing we can do to make it ever work again. Not with today's technology. The one to the right, that is a vitrified kidney. That is perfused with that glycerol, that glycerol that the frog uses to, to freeze itself every year and come back without any damage. That is a vitrified kidney. This particular study was done in which they took a kidney out of a healthy rabbit and they vitrified that kidney, kept it stored for a significant period of time. They thawed it and re-implanted it into a new rabbit. And that new rabbit survived with that vitrified kidney. This is a real world example of an organ being vitrified, being stored, and then being brought back into a state of functionality. So those who say the cryonics people, they're just a little bit premature or it's never going to work, they're not aware of the fact that in the cryopreservation research process, we're already making events occur that the, most of the world is not aware of. And maybe one of the more significant events is with frozen rabbit brains. We are able to vitrify. We're able to freeze these rabbit brains, reanimate them to the point where we can at least get electroencephalograph activity going. We can see the EEG readings, meaning these frozen brain slices that were vitrified, brought down to these liquid nitrogen temperatures they're able to be restored. And that's with today's technology, which is extremely primitive compared to where we're going to be not too far from now. And again, talking about medical, cryogenics, cryonics, we view this as a medical procedure. People who are cryopreserved are referred to as patients. We don't regard them as being permanently dead. They're simply not able to survive with today's technology. Tomorrow's technology may very well result in the ability to repair whatever damage occurred during the cryopreservation process, cure the disease that caused them to die, and most probably reverse the aging process. We believe these people will come back in a youthful state, not in the decrepit state that they may have died in. And that technology is going to come, we believe, through nano technology. This is working at the very tiny level, being able to go into cells and repair the damage atom by atom. And this, of course, is so valuable from a commercial standpoint. You've got the largest companies in the world spending billions of dollars in research to develop nanotechnology, not for the purpose of reanimating cryopreserved individuals, by the way. They're simply doing it to make a lot of money. But we don't care. We're grateful they're doing it because we can't wait 
wait till they develop that technology in the medical arena so that we can use it to start reanimating cryopreserved human beings. The technology is going to evolve one way or another, not because, again, people uh, are, are in a hurry to revive the two or 300 cryonicists that are cryopreserved now. They just simply want to turn it into a commercial success, which is why we are so motivated to feel that this is going to work. And the first hint of this, by the way, occurred in, in 1986. This book, Engines of Creation, written by Eric Drexler, it's what turned cryonics around. It's what turned cryonics into a belief system where people simply thought, well, maybe in the future there'll be a way to revive these people, but we have no idea how to do it. And scientists said, well, if we have no idea how to do it, it probably won't work. Eric Drexler wrote a book that explained exactly how it may be possible in the future through nanotechnology to revive cryopreserved human beings even cryopreserved people who were preserved under imperfect methods. He explained how nanorobots could go into a body and rearrange damaged cells one by one, repair and rejuvenate those damaged cells to result in the restoration of cryopreserved people. So this book in 1986 was a turning point, and I've been involved in cryonics since the early 1970s when virtually nobody was interested. It was very hard to get people to even pay any serious serious attention to it. When we first started our local cryonics group here in South Florida, we had about 15 members. We then merged with Alcor, which at that time was in California. And the total of these two groups together was about 60. 60 human beings uh, who wanted to be signed up to be cryopreserved. Uh, just a couple months ago, Alcor surpassed over 1,000 signed up cryopreservation members. And they, they currently have about 130 people in cryopreservation right now. They actually have like double the amount of people cryopreserved as what they were before this book came out who, who were signed up to have it done. So I was around in 1986 and my, my phone started ringing. Uh, people saying, I'm, I'm now interested in this cryopreservation process. And I didn't even know the book came out, by the way, but it, it got out in the media rather quickly. And I said, well, well that's great. Uh, what, what made you change your mind here? They said, well, I read Engines of Creation. I now understand how it may be possible to revive a cryopreserved human. Before this book came out, we just didn't understand. One of the problems that Ben Franklin had is he just, there was no way for him to be preserved. And he recognized the fact that the science had not evolved sufficiently to enable him to enjoy the future world he so much wanted to be a part of. But what's interesting is what we so take for granted, what we so often take for granted, uh, it took someone's effort to figure out a way to build a doer, a, a capsule as we call it in the, in the cryonics world sometimes, to hold liquid nitrogen so it would not rapidly boil off. And in 1892, an individual named James Dewar, and that's why these cryonics capsules are referred to as doers, he invented a vacuum seal technology that enabled liquid nitrogen to be stored at a very low boil off rate. That was a turning point. That enabled the long-term preservation of biological tissues and whole bodies at low temperature. And in a relatively short period of time in the grand scheme of, of history, in 1967, the first man was cryopreserved. Ian A. Dewar invented back in 1892. So it didn't take long for someone to figure out, hey, if you can preserve biological specimens with this, why not preserve the entire body? And it happened in 1967 with Dr. Bedford. So this is just a little history of liquid nitrogen and how it was discovered, how it, was, how it slowly progressed, how people started to, to discover it could be used in so many different ways and eventually found that, well, why don't we just use it to preserve ourselves so that we can and take advantage of future medical advances. And so this history, it shows you, by the way, how every great breakthrough, it starts off in a very primitive way. And Ben Franklin, by the way, he was involved in some very primitive, as I mentioned, coolant technologies. He was looking to figure out ways to refrigerate. And it started you know, way before Franklin, in many respects, how this technology could evolve and, and where we are right now. 
Interesting thing about liquid nitrogen is it's widely available. It's an industrial byproduct. It's very inexpensive. And that's great news for people who require preserved because we need to keep them cryo preserved for several hundred years in all probability. And if liquid nitrogen was not widely available, we might be concerned that some catastrophe would make it unavailable. Well, it's readily available. Um, we, we always ship it in from other parts of the country if it was temporarily disabled in, in one part of the country. So there's no problem with it. It's widely available and it's cheap. Uh, it doesn't cost a lot to buy because it's a byproduct, meaning the companies that make it are anxious to get rid of it. So they sell it really cheap, meaning we can keep human beings cryopreserved at a very low price for an indefinite period of time. Liquid nitrogen cost is no longer a factor in precluding long-term storage of human beings. The insulation of cryovessels is an area that we constantly look to improve because that's what enables us to lower liquid nitrogen costs even further. Uh, the lower the boil off rate, the less money we have to spend on liquid nitrogen. So a lot of the research that are being done by the cryonics organizations is figuring out how can we further insulate these capsules to improve on, on what James Dewar discovered in 1892 to lower the boil off rate even more. Ideally, we get these costs down so low we make cryonics affordable to virtually everybody. And there are now ways, by the way, in which long-term preservation is affordable to everybody. There's no reason economically anymore why everyone cannot be preserved in one way or another that gives them some chance of future revival. So some of the prospects that we're working on right now is perfecting whole brain cryopreservation. A lot of time, money, and effort is being put into this project. It's being conducted by some of the most prominent cryobiologists in the world. These people work enormous amounts of time. They are signed up cryonicists. They want to perfect this, if for no other reason, so that they can be cryopreserved and reanimated at some time in the future. We've been attracting more and more medical people by by the way, into the cryonics field. It's now gaining wider acceptance than what it used to in the very beginning, when people just didn't understand how it could ever happen. What we're currently spending some efforts on, by the way, is developing an intermediate storage capsule that can enable us to store people at higher temperatures than liquid nitrogen. The advantage of doing that is that at the higher temperatures, we still prevent enough molecular motion to preclude any type of decomposition damage from occurring, but we reduce the amount of ice crystal formation further. Quite a bit of money is being spent at this time developing a better cryopreservation doer that will enable us to modulate the temperature to achieve a greater degree of success in maintaining people long term. Now, you all came here tonight to learn a little bit about cryonics, but the big surprise that I think you understand what the topic is, but I think these pictures are going to impress you, is something that Tanya, Tanya is sitting right there in the front row, and she called me last year around this time, and she said, Bill, I've just run into something that you're going to love. It's, a, it's an incredible place, something that is a one-of-a-kind type of underground facility, and, and I told Tanya, I've got too much on my plate right now. We've just started this church. We've got all kinds of research projects going on right now. I just can't take on anything new. But she kept twisting my arm and I finally said, okay, I'll take a look at it. Now, what we're going to show you here is something to just impress you a little bit and maybe give you a break from my talk on why freezing is now so socially acceptable no one's even questioning the viability of frozen life coming back to life. In an era when many women postpone motherhood into their late 30s or beyond, a growing number hope a new technology can expand their options. Here's Dr. John LaPook. Doing all right? Yeah. One week before her 30th birthday, actress Elizabeth Higgins Clark is taking a dramatic step to preserve her fertility. Why did you start thinking about saving your eggs? I knew that I wanted more time and for my career. I thought it would be really nice if I could make it so that I had a baby when my life was ready instead of just because my body is ready. There's a gradually growing population of women who are choosing to do this electively. Dr. Michael Drews is Clark's doctor at Reproductive Medicine Associates of New Jersey. Probably when this comes into its own will be more liberating to women than the, the oral contraceptives uh, were back in the 1960s. As eggs age, the success of fertility procedures declines. Research shows eggs frozen at age 30 are twice as likely to result in a pregnancy as eggs frozen at 40. 
Yet one study found over 80% of women freezing their eggs were older than 35. The light goes off for most women when they begin to reach their later 30s or early 40s, um, and that's when they say, gee, I I'm, I'm running out of time. Unfortunately, in most cases, they've largely already run out of time. There are no national figures on how many women have frozen their eggs or returned to use them. The American Society for Reproductive Medicine does not endorse elective egg freezing, saying it may give women false hope and encourage women to delay childbearing. What's your reaction to that? I don't think my hope is false. I think it gives me a better chance, and I wouldn't tell any woman that she should do this. I think it's a really personal decision that a woman makes with her doctor and her bank account. The procedure costs between ten dollars and $15,000 and another $1,000 a year to keep the eggs frozen. Still, Clark says it's money well spent. Is there part of this for you that's slowing down that biological clock that's been ticking? Yes, it stopped. And I'll get older, but my eggs will stay the same age, 29 forever. Though egg freezing is still an uncommon procedure, there are signs it may be increasing in popularity. Apple and Facebook recently announced their health insurance plans will now cover elective egg freezing, a move that could spur other companies to follow suit. All right, Dr. John LaPook, thank you. Now, that was a segment from CBS News, and I think everyone understands the media. They love to be critical. They love to be judgmental. But what you didn't see there is anyone saying you can't freeze human eggs and revive them and produce children. No one said that because that wouldn't be true. This is being done on a routine basis nowadays. But it's just a, a trivial little example of life or a pre-life being frozen and being used then to create a new life form. So the, the idea that you can't freeze and reanimate, that just isn't true. Our, our challenge now is cryopreserving entire human beings and reanimating them. That's our challenge. But those who don't believe in this, they're just ignoring a lot of reality. So we're going to continue now with my presentation on the famous, and I do mean famous. Uh, I was surprised how many people around the world understand this underground house that is in Las Vegas. Now, this is the top of it. This is what houses look like, by the way, in Las Vegas. They don't get a lot of rain, so people don't have lawns. They pretty much have some cacti and, and some gravel and some nice rocks. What you're looking at is about one acre of property. It's about 10 minutes off the famous Las Vegas Strip with all the big casinos, and it's got a mediocre house on top of it. That's a nice house, about 2,800 square feet, relatively new, uh, and that's basically for the caretakers. Underneath it's very different. This is a, another picture of this typical Las Vegas house. What's a little bit different is that it's in a neighborhood of regular houses, but it sits on one acre of land. Now, when you go into this house, there are two elevators and there's some, a staircase. There's also staircases, by the way, they're kind of hidden on the outside that lets you go down about 27 feet under the ground. And when you go down those 27 feet, when I made my first trip down there, I couldn't quite believe what I saw. Uh, this is something where I've been to a few famous places around the world, but this impressed me more than possibly anything else, mainly because it's real. This is not some Las Vegas facade you're going to see. This was really built by one of the co-founders of Avon Cosmetics. The cost to build what you're going to see in today's dollars would be over $40 million dollars, in today's dollars. The founder of Avon believed that nuclear war was inevitable, and he wanted to live out the nuclear holocaust in a high level of comfort. So he decided to build what is a now a very famous landmark, it's called the underground house. So just imagine descending in an elevator after going into this well-to-do, moderate house in, in Las Vegas, going down, the elevator opens, and the first thing you see is something that looks like you're above ground. That is 27 feet under the ground. Uh, that is uh, artificial grass, and it is a house that is surrounded by beautiful murals, beautiful everything. A swimming pool with uh, some rocks which encompass two jacuzzis. I, I guess they want to put two in there in case people weren't getting along. They could each have their own jacuzzi for the night. But it's a place where you realize you are underground, but it's one of the most serene, tranquil, beautiful places that you've ever been in. And he made it that way. 
he hired some of the greatest artists in the world to design this in a way that when he was living there, which he felt was going to be indefinitely, he wanted it to be a very nice place. So you're there underground, and it also has uh, controls so that when dusk occurs, the lights change. The sun goes down, it starts getting darker, and eventually you have a nice starlit night to look at. This is about 17,000 square feet, by the way, underground. Just to understand, it is huge. It never seems to end when you're walking around it. In the photographs, this will be a daylight picture. And you've got the artificial trees, the artificial grass, the murals that make it look like it goes on forever. It looks bigger than 17,000 square feet, if you can imagine. And uh, again, it looks just like a 1970s house. This was built, by the way, in the 1970s. So everything is designed around that type of architectural design. This is a, a view of the guest house. Uh, there's the main house, but he wanted to have his servants' quarters uh, separate and apart. And again, everything is just done in such a way that you feel like you're walking through a fairy tale. It's something that uh, impressed me more than any other facility I'd ever been in. Here's a view from inside the house, looking outside. And I think a lot of us wish we had backyards like this because it really is a very impressive situation they did. This is the kitchen. Again, it's the 1970s design. It's kind of frozen in time, and we're keeping it that way. We're not going to change anything as far as the original architecture or, or design. We're keeping it just the way it is. And uh, for people who want to travel back in time from a historic standpoint, uh, I think this house will be impressive, as I indicated. These are the empty rooms. Uh, we're going to show you with furniture in just a few minutes. These are the empty rooms. And I should mention a purpose of why we bought this. We hope will function as a backup storage facility in the event that there is a catastrophe looming and the cryopreservation patients need a safe place to be stored. It's not ready to store them yet, but when it is ready, it will provide a very nice backup emergency storage facility to ensure that cryopreservation patients have a safe and secure place to be stored and also a very aesthetically appealing place to be stored. Again, in another view from being inside the house, if you can imagine, this is before it was furnished, just looking out, looking out with the beautiful grass, the murals, which you'll see some more pictures of. Again, everything here, the shag rug, the design, you feel like you walked into the 1970s. This is the bathroom, nice bathtub with columns. This is a grill. It has ventilation going to the top, so if you want to barbecue, you can do it underground safely. He wanted to make sure he had every amenity imaginable while he planned to spend his uh, life underground when the nuclear holocaust occurred, which of course it didn't. This is just a particularly nice area, a beautiful fountain. And what we imagine doing, by the way, is putting the, the stainless steel doors, just lining them up about two or three feet apart, surrounding this house. This artificial grass, by the way, goes completely around the house and it, it's so spacious you feel like you could house quite a few capsules. This again is a picture of the swimming pool and the rocks where they have the, the jacuzzis uh, embedded in them. This is a, a back part of the house and again if you can just picture cryo capsules. These doors stand about 16 feet high and they look like very big bright shiny hot water tanks and these are how we store our cryo patients. But we feel this would just be such a pleasant place to be stored in perpetuity awaiting future technology to figure a way to revive us. We have two people working in this full time by the way. Again the, the empty pool currently with the rocks. And this is the inside. They've stocked a bar, just like we have downstairs. Uh, not nearly as fancy downstairs as what they have here. We have a nice bar inside. We do intend to have a lot of events at this house. We think we can attract a lot of influential people to come down just to see it. This place was so newsworthy, by the way, on the day that we bought it. The media was calling us up. They want to know what we're going to do with it because it is famous. It, it, it's gotten a lot of favorable media publicity since it was built in the 1970s. And by the way, to learn all about this on Google and type underground house Vegas and you'll read hundreds of stories about it. Again, this is uh, just some furniture that we put around it. We want to be able to bring a couple hundred people down here to enjoy an afternoon where we talk about cryonics, immortality, talk about ways to slow aging. We want people to be comfortable. And this is the furniture now inside. What the two people who were working out there did is they went to auctions of furniture that resembled that of the 1970s. Actually, a lot of it was 1970s vintage. And they bought that furniture for pennies on the dollar. We are one of the few people who probably had a real use for it. So this is a, another view of it. Just uh, nicely furnished. 
and a bedroom. They put new mattresses down there. Well, it was completely empty when we bought it, so everything is either uh, refurbished, something we got at an auction, and we bought new mattresses. And uh, we're going to let people stay down there if they want, by the way, just to experience what it's like to live 27 feet underground and have every amenity that you'd like to have when you're above ground. Another view, and if you can just imagine these large, shiny, stainless steel doors just three feet apart going completely around the underground house. People living in the house, of course, taking care of maintaining those doors and having all kinds of backup technology. It's just one of the many, many murals that were painted. And it's hard to visualize, but I can tell you, you stand there and it looks real. It looks like you're looking at a house maybe a half a mile away, but it's just a painting on a wall. But when you're a great artist, and he hired the best artist imaginable, you can create these kind of images and kind of emulate real life. So uh, the, the entire surrounding of this 17,000 square foot area is nothing but these beautiful painted murals that look just incredible. And uh, we spent probably three hours down there. We really did not want to leave. That's how nice it was. And it was just, it wasn't furnished or anything. It's just everywhere you went, it was like a little surprise, something new, something you wouldn't expect. Uh, this is a, a, just another mural that he decided to paint. And another mural, this probably is showing it a little bit, what it looks like uh, at dusk or at nighttime where the lighting becomes uh, very different. And another picture showing maybe a night or a dusk view. Uh, another angle of the house. And again, what we intend to do is have cryo capsules. Uh, these doers will be surrounding this house in the event of an emergency, 27 feet underground in a facility designed to withstand a nuclear attack in addition to the light changing. So when you wake up, you always have a sunny day, and then dusk will occur, and you have a bright starry night. There's the audio, too. Again, $40 million goes a long way. And this person, he really tried to think of everything. Three years painting the murals. That, that, that's a patient individual, both the person who paid for it and the person who did it. Three years of painting. These are showing some of the dusk pictures. This would be more in the daylight. And uh, again, when we were down there, we just didn't want to leave. It just felt so secure. Again, the famous underground house in Las Vegas, it's now owned by a 501c3 organization. We intend to keep this in perpetuity as a backup storage. This is a picture, I believe, at night. A nighttime picture again. And a uh, real night, nighttime sky. Nice uh, starlit nights. You always want it nice and bright and the uh, kind of situation that we'd want to spend perpetuity in. The starlit sky, you can't get that in reality. You get it 27 feet underground, but not on top. Certainly not in Las Vegas. So what I'm showing here is what the typical fallout shelter looked like in the 50s and 60s and 70s. This is not where you wanted to be. And that's why the Avon founder, Mr. Henderson, he built that underground house. He wanted to be in a comfortable environment in the event that the worst happened. And so when Tanya first told me about this underground house, this is what I was thinking. You know, some dungeon underground that you'd be safe, but you really wouldn't be very comfortable. And instead, he did what you just saw there with the underground house pictures. But this is what people were doing during the Cold War. They were building fallout shelters. It's not very pleasant. You don't really want to stay there. Another picture of fallout shelters and just some basic historical data about this underground house. And again, what's really interesting is you have the ability to look at the history of this on Google, read everything you want to read about it. It is a very interesting case history. I want to thank everyone for attending, and I look forward to talking to everyone downstairs.